Um, perfect. Well, thanks so much for the invitation. It's very exciting to, to have this opportunity. I mean, as Federico said, um, I'm all for question, comments, whatever comes to mind, feel free to, to speak up and interrupt, but you know, I'll also try to, to space it out and, and, and keep, some, keep, keep some space for questions. Um, so this is a paper with just joint work with my colleague Fabrizio Zilibotti at Yale and, and uh, Tian Yu Fan, who's a graduate student at Yale. Um, and it's about India, and in particular, it's about the unequal effects of service-led growth. Um, so services um, play a large and growing role in poor countries. This terrorization is on the rise everywhere. And um, I think there's the traditional view that this is mostly a phenomenon which is salient for rich countries. This idea that as you go out of manufacturing, you go into services, and, but somehow hasn't really been uh, is not so important for poor countries. Now, I think that view is, is somewhat of a caricature of the growth process, precisely because growth today looks different than it was 70 years ago. And so today, services, as you know, many of you know, play, play a large role in poor countries, play a growing role in poor countries, and in particular, account for the bulk of reallocation from agriculture into services. And so I think traditionally, there are kind of two views that explain this importance and this rise of the service sector. On the one hand, what you see here um, on the left is this view that service employment or the service sector is really a corollary of economic growth and economic development, whereby productivity growth takes place in other sectors of the economy, incomes rise, and because services are income elastic, as people get richer, they buy more of this stuff. So this is the traditional sort of Baumol view of the service sector. You know, on the right is this alternative view where we think that productivity growth might be happening in the service sector too. And to the extent that that's the case, you know, economic development and economic growth is at least partially service led. So what we want to do in this paper is we want to focus on this right piece here, this idea that the service sector can experience real productivity growth. And, and one thing which we're particularly focusing on in this paper is trying to estimate the welfare consequences of this productivity growth. And so in this paper, we're focusing in particular on the implications for inequality, particularly the extent to which these effects of productivity growth and services have heterogeneous effects across both space and the income distribution. So there's two reasons why we think that this link between productivity growth and services and inequality are particularly salient. And these, two, these links have to do with two properties of the service sector, which we think are essential. First, a large chunk of services are on the type of services which we're going to focus on have a non-tradable component. Like many of the services which are directed towards consumers, think about, you know, retail, hospitality, consumer finance, all of these things have this non-tradable feature. And so productivity growth in these sectors is particularly relevant for the people that live in a particular location, but they can't be exported. So that's the spatial dimension. Second, there's this big I think um, uh, a sort of difference across the income distribution precisely because if we think that services are luxury goods where uh, that, and, and, they're, uh, and then, you know, rich people have a higher spending share on these services, you know, that's another force which makes productivity growth in these services particularly important for rich households. And so, you know, what we want to do in this paper is kind of try to kind of quantify the extent to which a productivity growth in services is real for a country like India and second, who are the main beneficiaries. So how we're going to do this, we're going to follow this uh, approach of development accounting. So we're not, what we're not going to do is we're not going to try to measure productivity growth and services directly. And we don't attempt to do that directly for two reasons. A, as you can anticipate or appreciate, and many of you know from, from having worked on this yourself, measuring productivity growth is, is very difficult in services where you know, issues of quality adjustment loom large. Secondly, at least for the case of India, we just don't have you know, service price deflators for the service sector, which are disaggregated at the regional levels. We don't have you know, a price deflator for services for Delhi and one for Mumbai and one for rural areas. And this is obviously the example which we're you know, particularly focused on given the non-tradable nature. So we're gonna take a different route, we're going to do an accounting exercise where we have a structural model of, of economic geography. We're going to use micro data on employment, expenditure, wages, population movements across space. 
And we're going to use that modeling structure to estimate productivity growth in the service sector between 1987 and, and 2011, 30 years of, of Indian growth. And then we're going to ask essentially a simple question. Conceptually, we want to ask, what would India look like if the service sector had not grown since 1987? And who would have lost most and who, who would have lost very little? So to set the stage, let me show you some data. Right? So we're going to focus on this episode from 1987 to 2011 in India, this kind of 30-year growth episode. This is you know, three decades which were you know, incredibly um, uh, profitable for India. I think income per capita raised by a factor of about three. And so here on the left, you see the structural transformation in India. And I think you know, this time series evolution of employment shares, they paint this kind of now pretty familiar picture of economic development, economic growth without industrialization. You see this quite sizable decline in agricultural employment from about two thirds of the labor force in 1987 to slightly less than half in 2011. You see that the manufacturing industry is basically flat. It's, 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 a, it's a low share, but more interestingly, it's essentially constant. And then you see this big rise in service employment from about 20% to about 33%. Michael? Yes, please, Mariana. A question. So uh, you said that you, you're going to ask whether uh, if what would have happened if the service industry would not have increased during this time, but what are you going to compare it to? Because if that would have been the case, <laughs> hard in English, <laughs> if it's <laughs> conditional uh, time, uh, then it would have happened that maybe agriculture wouldn't have decreased so much, or it would have happened that manufacturing would have taken that part or, or something like that, right? Exactly. So we're going to, so we're going to, and I'm going to show you exactly that exercise. So, so what we're going to do is we're going to estimate productivity growth through the lens of the model from uh, in these three sectors and different locations from 87 to 2011. And then within that structure, we can ask that counterfactual question, you know, what happened if service growth had not been taken place? And I think exactly as you point out, you know, this changes sectoral reallocation, this changes wages, prices, etc. It has implications for welfare, which is the one which I'm going to focus on, but it also has implications for precisely these patterns of the structural transformation. And one thing which we're going to see exactly is that this decline in agricultural employment would have been far less severe or less stark if the service sector had been, uh, had been constant. So, you know, to give you a number, just in case I don't make it there at the end, Right. We would, you know, from our, what our model suggests is that this decline of agricultural employment by about 16 or yeah, 16, 17 percentage point, you know, only half would have taken place if service, uh, if productivity in the service sector had not grown. What this exercise does not do is you could think that there might be important linkages across sectors, right? That somehow if productivity growth and services had been low, productivity growth and manufacturing might have also been low or might have been higher. So we're going to take the path of productivity growth in these other sectors as given and only ask what happens if service sector productivity have been flat. For comparison, I'm going to show you these other sectors too, obviously, what would have happened if agriculture had not grown, manufacturing had not grown, etc. Right? So you can see sort of a comparison, both of the welfare effects uh, and for the structural transformation effects. And just a little follow up, uh, because what would think that if, you know, if, if a sector, so if the productivity uh, did not grow, maybe more people would have moved to other sectors and maybe because of that, the productivity in the other sector would have grown more, right? Absolutely. So there's a I'm learning by doing kind of totally, uh, productivity totally, growth. So, totally agree with you. So the, for the counterfactual exercise, which I'm going to show you is we're going to rest on a neoclassical model, where, which basically thinks that productivity evolves exogenously. Now, I'm going to be much more precise about this when I show you the model that the way how we estimate the model that is totally consistent with the view that maybe productivity depends on the size of the sector through some learning by doing agglomeration, direct technological change. So that is totally fine. Once you ask the counterfactual question, I totally agree with you, right? So then we need to take a stand on what happens to the productivity things in other sector, the productivity fundamentals are they going to be exogenous, are going to be endogenous. So I'm going to be much more precise about this when I show you the exact exercise. Thank you. Um, Michael, 
Hey, Carlos, yes. I'm Carlos from the Central Bank of Chile. Uh, just to ask you a question. Uh, so, when we look here at manufacturing, it seems to be stable at 15%, but I wonder if that is hiding major changes in manufacturing. But I wonder, perhaps India was a close economy in the 70s and, and 80s. So maybe it started with very inefficient and close manufacturers. But now these are manufacturers that are open and internationally competitive. So I wonder if uh, that is being hidden in uh, this figure. Good. Very good point. So. I think both of your uh, both of your comments are definitely true. So what I'm going to show you in our model, there you know this time period obviously had substantial productivity growth in manufacturing. So we're going to find when we estimate that there is substantial productivity growth in manufacturing taking place in Chile and Chile in India, probably in Chile too. Um, our main analysis is going to be a closed economy. Um, but I'm going to show you these numbers, you know, how much did productivity increase in manufacturing and agriculture and services. So there is real growth. And so whether that results from, you know, a reallocation of economic activity from, you know, less to more, more productive firms, that's going to be hidden in our, in our methodology. The second thing, which, which we are going to do precisely because that international component is, is uh, presumably important for India. We're going to do an extension of our analysis where we do an open economy model. And in particular, it's exactly going to be a version of the model where India can trade both industrial goods and given the Indian context and can trade these services, in particular, ICT services, exports, you know, call centers, programming services, et cetera, which seem to be important. And so I'm going to show you a version of our model where India is going to do exactly that, where they're going to be exporting some of these things in which case, you know, opening up the trade might exactly have those effects, which you highlight. Mm -hmm. um, now, as far as I services go. are, uh, yes. Sorry. <laughs> well, one more thing. Um, sure. Maybe you will develop this idea later, but I mean, from what I understand, you will use this development accounting uh, methodology to back, uh, back, back out the productivity evolution of the services sector in different places. Um, but that productivity measure, uh, I mean, you, you claim at the beginning that it will be, you will focus on the productivity part and you will not focus on the, like, the non-homophaticity part, but this productivity measure that you back out could it be a result of the, like, by these scale effects, like, uh, by the non-homophaticity aspect, right? Perfect. So let me say two things about it. The, the non-homophaticities play, like, a crucial role in our whole analysis. First, they're going to be important to estimate the model, right? In particular, right, we want to distinguish, think about, think about a particular example, Delhi, right? So Delhi, or Bangalore, Mumbai, these are examples of cities in the Indian context, which saw huge increases in service employment. And I think for these examples, it's particularly salient that you need to somehow distinguish in the model. Well, is that because people in Delhi get rich, there's a lot of income growth, people get richer, that's why they go to restaurants, or is it the case that there's a lot of productivity growth in restaurants in Delhi? So the non homophaticity taking into account the non homophaticity is crucial to consistently estimate this relationship between employment growth and productivity growth. And so I'm gonna show you quantitatively that there is a big part of Indian growth which is purely service led. It's kind of the flip side of my answer, which I gave to Mariana, that yeah, yeah. even if there was no productivity growth in services, the service sector had grown. Agricultural employment would have fallen, but just not as much as what we see in the data. Okay. Now, I think your second point is, is more subtle, and there we're not going to have much to say about it. I think this is related to what Mariana was saying, right? If it is the case that non homothaticities drive people into the service sector, that increases service scale, and that's why some of productivity picks up. You know, I looked at some of these things in sort of other work in, in, in Germany and in the US, so here we're not going to have much to say about it. Our estimation is consistent with all of these mechanisms, 
once I kind of come back to how to interpret the quantitative numbers for the counterfactuals, I'm going to be mindful of the fact to remind you, you know, what exactly do we have to assume for these numbers to be meaningful for the Indian context. Okay, um, thanks. Good. So, you know, let me just zoom in a little bit into the service sector, right? And so, because the service sector is, is very heterogeneous, as you know, it's heterogeneous by the type of things which we plug into the service sector and it's particularly heterogeneous in, in the way or in the, you know, in the, in the regional component where these services are provided, right? I just had a long and interesting conversation with Jorge who documents these very similar facts in, in, in Canada. So here I'm going to show you just some examples, a decomposition of the service sector in different components, wholesale and retail, health and community services, finance, ICT, education and, and, uh, and public administration. And I show you all these employment shares for the whole economy for 1987, 2011, and then for rural and urban districts in orange and, and red, particularly. And the things which I want you to take away is first, you know, services which are intrinsically related to something which consumers directly purchase, retail, restaurants, wholesale, health community services. These are large. And these are growing between 1987 and 2011. You also see a lot of growth in finance, business, and transport. In particular, see a lot of expansion of these type of services in, in, in urban districts and cities. You know, ICT, which I think we always think is, is a very big deal in India. It's a big deal, but in relative terms, you know, the ICT employment share is still relatively low, right? Even in urban India, you know, only two and a half percent of employment is in ICT services, and you can see here, in rural India, ICT services are essentially absent. Right? And so, you know, we're going to use some novel data about the service sector in India, which, which enables us to think about a decomposition of, you know, which of these services are non-tradable in nature and are directed towards consumers, something like retail, hotels, restaurants. Which of these services are more what we'd be calling producer services in tradable nature, something like finance and business, whereby, you know, a bank in Mumbai can somehow export its finance services to the rest of India or in our extension to the rest of the world. And so here's what we're going to find. We're going to be particularly interested in this piece, in this type of what we'll be calling consumer services. And once I show you the theory on the next slide, you see an exact kind of definition on how we conceptualize this notion of consumer services. And so what we're going to be finding is that productivity growth in this sector plays a big role plays an important role for rising living standards. If you want to take away a number for now, which I'm going to build towards to, we estimate that roughly a third of the rise in living standards in India since 1987 is due to productivity growth in exactly this provision of consumer services. And second, the benefits or the welfare benefits are going to be very skewed. The main beneficiaries of productivity growth in the sectors are going to be rich consumers and urban locations, right? And so in the re remaining hour, I'll kind of tell you what kind of theory and what data we kind of bring to bear to kind of come to these conclusions. Okay, so this is what I want to do in the in the next hour. So I'm going to first show you the theory, um, and 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 that's going to kind of develop into a framework you can use to estimate all of these objects. And I'm going to tell you about the measurement and how we estimate both the structural parameters and and how we treat the data. And then once we have that, I'm going to show you these quantification exercises in particular. You know, the unequal welfare effects, but, you know, I try to keep some time and, and click on the link for, uh, for Mariana also the effect on the, on the structural transformation. Okay, so let me show you the, let me show you the, the theory, uh, but um, let me also hold on for about another 20 seconds in case there are any questions until now. Good. So, uh, this is the model which we have in mind. So, we're going to think about the model with our regions in our quantitative applications, these are going to be districts, there are going to be 400 of those in India. So each of those districts is going to have three sectors where people can work, agriculture, industry, and consumer services. I'm going to call this industry, it's not, I'm not going to refer to it as manufacturing at this point, I'm going to call this the industrial sector, and you'll see that later down the road, because we're going to think of some of these producer services finance, lawyers, et cetera, to add their value added into this industrial sector, right? Sometimes I might say manufacturing, but you should really think about this is the sector that produces tradable goods 
And the value added of lawyers and finance and so on is going to be embodied in this tradable goods and therefore tradable. So as I said, agriculture produces food, industry produces goods. Both of these are tradable across space in India for our extension to the rest of the world. And then consumers who are located in these individual regions, they're going to have preferences over final goods. And these final goods, they're going to be intrinsically non-tradable. Why are they going to be non-tradable? Because final goods are a combination of these tradable, let's call it inputs, food and goods. But then to actually consume them, you have to add a local component, what we'll be calling consumer services. Now, if you go to the supermarket, you have to add the value added of the retail worker. If you go to a restaurant, you have to add the, rel the value added of the cook and the waiter. Um, so this is what our model is going to be looking like for three regions. As I said, we're going to have 400. Um, Three sectors in each region, agriculture, consumer services, industry. Agriculture is going to be a tradable good. All of the output of these different regions are going to be combined in food. Industry, the same, is going to be combined in goods. And then the final goods, these non-tradable goods, which the consumers that live in region one here are going to eat, is the combination of these tradable components and the consumer service piece. So uh, let me show you the... the the precise production function, how we're going to envision this. So we're going to think about that each region R produces this measure one continuum of these local non-tradable final goods. They're all going to be put together in this, in this um, Cobb-Douglas production function, whereby the output of good N in region R uses food, XF, uses goods, XG, and uses this consumer service input, which is a combination of the actual human capital, which is you know, used in this consumer service sector for, that produces good end, uh, and what we'll be calling the productivity term, right? The labor augmenting productivity term of consumer service workers in these, uh, in these, um, um, in this good. Um, these Cobb Douglas expenditure shares or important shares, lambda, are going to be good specific, right? So for some goods, they are mostly food, for some goods, they're mostly consumer services. So let me show you kind of some examples. Think about a restaurant meal, right? A restaurant meal has some ingredients. This is going to be the food piece. The food piece is going to have some goods. Think about the kitchen equipment, the plates, the oven, and then has a consumer service piece. And part of, that, part of that is going to be the pure labor input, the cooks and the waiters. And some of these are going to be, a, you know, the productivity with which these cooks and waiters can be put to use in the production of restaurant meals in the particular locations, right? So you can think about the variety of recipes they have access to, the quality of services uh, which have the access to in Delhi relative to a rural area. For a cell phone, right, there's not going not to be any very little food. There's going to be the actual phone. Uh, there's going to be a consumer service piece, the retail workers, maybe the shopping experience if you go to the Apple store relative to a mom and pop store to buy your cell phone. If you think of a classic commodity in India, rice on the market, it probably combines mostly food and then maybe a little bit of consumer services for the market vendor. So these are going to be these different goods which we're going to have in our theory, and there's going to be many of those in our theory. There's going to be a whole continuum which differ in their lambdas and their productivity, uh, which, which they can be provided. Michael, now, so yes, please. labor will not be a model across regions. Good. I'm going to show you the version of the model where labor is perfectly mobile across sectors, but fixed across regions. We also have an extension or we have mobility across regions. If you have time at the end, I can click on the link and, and kind of walk you through what would change. For the estimation of the model, we don't need to take a stand on labor mobility. For the counterfactual, as you can imagine, it's going to be important. And, and you know, if you have time, I can click on the link to kind of show you how, how important that is. Okay, great. Uh, Thank you. So on the tradable side, there's not going to be any innovation. It's going to be an arming and structure elasticity of substitution that you combine these different varieties out of these different regions. Michael? Yes, please. Sorry, yeah. I have a question. Uh, what about other consumer services that we would think that are more tradable, like financing services, banking, or even some like e-commerce? Uh, Very good. I understand what you're doing, but I feel like also a lot of these, the rising services has also been driven by is financial services that are getting more widespread. So I don't know how you how would they fit in your those three examples you gave. Absolutely, very good. So here's what I'm going to do with this in the data. So you're absolutely right. Uh, think about a, a restaurant meal that fits into our classification, but 
what about the value added provided for lawyers, right, or, or a finance? And so we are going to kind of plug together these lawyers and, and everybody working in finance in the production of these industrial goods. And so how are we going to do that? Um, if you don't mind, for now, let me just tell you that all of the value added created by exactly the industries which you have in mind, finance and lawyers, we're going to account for it. We're going to measure their productivity growth. And maybe let me hold on for a couple of slides so I can show you exactly how we do it, both in the theory and in the data. Okay. Um, so a key part of our analysis is obviously consumer preferences, precisely because we you know, I want to capture the fact that people in Delhi might be buying more of these consumer services simply because we're going to, they're going to be richer. And so we're going to define our preferences by this indirect utility function in this PIGL class. So this class has been developed by uh, Mühlbauer in the 70s, has been used a lot in, by, by Angus Deaton in the 80s, and has been recently popularized again by, by Timo Bopard and co-authors. So these preferences, they don't have an explicit utility representation, but they're defined by an indirect utility function, which in its general form takes this following case. It, you know, it's an indirect utility function defined over expenditure E and these prices, and these prices enter you know, in this form as a, as a sort of price index that looks like a real income term and in this additive component. So the fact that they're additive, that defines the name of these preferences, PIGL, price independent, generalized linear, this is going to be this piece. So we're going to take a particular parameterization of these preferences. In particular, we're going to assume that these functions B and D take these, you know, they look almost like a Cobb-Douglas form. So instead of trying to explain this indirect utility function, let me show you exactly, or let me show you the demand function, which this indirect utility function implies. In particular, you know, you can apply Roy's identity to this indirect utility function to derive the implied demand function of the expenditure shares. And so what are these expenditure shares? So this is the expenditure share of somebody with income E facing prices R, right? This whole continuum of final goods prices who lives in locate, um, for good M. Um, and, you know, these preferences, they imply that the expenditure shares take this particular form. They look like a Cobb-Douglas demand function with a non-homothetic adjustment. In particular, each of these continuum of goods is characterized by two numbers. It's going to be characterized by this beta and it's characterized by this kappa. And then there is going to be a common elasticity, this epsilon, which is going to be the key parameter of our model, which is going to determine the, uh, the, the extent of these income effects. So here on the right, you see two particular examples of these angle curves, these expenditure shares. In purple, you have a necessity, right? Necessity, the ne goods which are ne uh, necessities, uh, they're going to be characterized by a positive kappa. If kappa is positive, this is a minus. So as expenditure rises, the expenditure share on these good falls, a classic example is food, right? Poor people spend a lot on food, rich people pay very little. Uh, and so these are the angle curves for food. Think about another example, you know, a restaurant meal in a three-star Michelin restaurant presumably a luxury good. This is going to be this piece here. The kappa is going to be negative. As people get richer, they're going to have a higher spending share on these three-star Michelin restaurants. As you can see here, asymptotically, as people get infinitely rich, these preferences, they're going to be converging to a Cobb-Douglas kind of utility function, whereby the spending shares in these different commodities are going to be constant. Now, for our application, you know, these kind of asymptotic results are not going to be particularly important because people are going to be sufficiently poor in India. So a lot of the action is in this range of the income distribution where these income elasticities are going to be very pronounced. So I mentioned this already, the key parameter of our analysis, that's going to be, you know, important on, on how we take the model to the data and, and what the quantitative results are, it's going to be this epsilon. If epsilon is very large, that means demand is going to be very income elastic that means, you know, as people get a little richer, they're going to start consuming consumer services very intensely. So that is going to be a, a setting whereby there's little need for productivity growth in consumer services because rising incomes can explain most of this, you know, rise in employment shares and consumer services. By contrast, if Epsilon is low, income effects are not going to be very important and there's going to be price effects going to be more important. 
I'm going to show you that we're going to estimate, or we think that we have a good way to estimate this epsilon, which we're going to be quite comfortable that the numbers which we get for this epsilon are going to be very reasonable and they're going to apply they're going to be imply a relatively big big importance of this consumer service employment share. But as you can imagine, I'm going to show you ample kind of robustness and other things how we could calibrate this epsilon. Now, you might wonder why on earth are these people using these PIGL preferences which start from this indirect utility, etc. I'm going to show you that this PIGL demand structure is going to have three important properties which we're going to rely on heavily. In particular, I'm going to show this on the next slide. Um, even though these preferences are non-homothetic, there is still an aggregation result where we can aggregate all these individual heterogeneous households into something which looks like an representative agent. And so that is going to be very useful to calibrate our model. Second, this is going to be very important, is that this PIGL preference is in particular the functional form which we adopt, that's the reason why we adopted it, allows us to make a tight link between the demand for the value added of a particular sector and the demand for final expenditure to a particular good. So uh, now some of you might know this famous paper by, by Richard Rogerson, Bertolt Herendorf and Akos Valentini in the AR where they exactly kind of lay out that there's a difference between preferences defined over value added and preferences defined over final expenditure. Precisely because we are going to estimate this epsilon from final expenditure data I'm going to show you that in this preference specification, there's a tight mapping between the two. And then third, uh, given our focus on the welfare results, these preferences allow us to define welfare function of the utilitarian household and so on in a, in a tractable way. Now, let me show you these results in like one slide, right? There's going to be more details in the paper, but I think you can get the gist of how these results work in, in, in one slide. So, so far, I told you what the individual demand for final goods look like. And so now we're going to derive the aggregate demand over sectoral value added, right? And so the way how we're going to think about the heterogeneity, we're going to think about heterogeneity in a very kind of factor neutral way. We're going to think about individuals that might differ in their human capital. Think about it this way, Q, right? The local efficiency. So somebody who's twice as, twice as smart earns twice as much. And we're going to think about this Q as being drawn from a location specific Pareto distribution, right? So the distribution function for local human capital in region R is going to take this form. So the skill distribution is going to be identical across space as far as the tail is concerned, but there are going to be differences, an important one, in the average level of human capital across space. That's going to be important. And we're going to measure, you know, empirically, we're going to try to measure these differences in human capital between, say, Delhi and the rural India from the distribution of schooling within each of each of these locations, right? But for now, for the theory, you can just think about, well, these, diff these locations differ in the human capital of the regions of the people that live in those locations. Now, here's what we show in the paper, right? So this is quite a, quite a mouthful. So let me kind of walk you through this uh, slowly. What we show in this paper is that the aggregate expenditure share of sectoral value added in region R is going to take this form uh, where these parameters are going to be appropriately weighted averages of the microparameters. So let me just walk you through this slowly. The aggregate expenditure share for the value added originating in, in the sector agriculture, in the industrial sector, or in consumer services is going to take this form. As you can see, it's again part of this PIGL of Peagle family, right? In particular, the spending share looks exactly like the spending share for individual final goods. It looks again as if preferences were from a Cobb Douglas utility function with a non homothetic adjustment. But these structural parameters, they are weighted averages of the microparameters. So think about this one, the omega S. Omega S, that's the asymptotic value added share of sector S, right? As wages rise or as people get infinitely rich, this last term disappears. So the aggregate demand system for sectoral value added takes this form uh, is, is a constant. And what is this omega s? Well, this omega s is exactly equal to this expenditure share weighted average of the asymptotic um, spending shares of the individual goods for this continuum from zero to one. Similarly, for this um, 
for this, um, you know, this non-homotopicity term omega s, or sorry, nu s. This nu s again is an expenditure share weighted average of these homotopicity parameters at the micro level, adjusted for this income distribution because this is the aggregates, not only at the individual level. Finally, there's going to be this notion of consumer service productivity in region R, this ARCS, that's what we're going to try to measure. And again, this is some appropriately weighted average of these productivity terms in region R for these differential goods, right? So we're going to work with this demand system. We're going to try to estimate that from the micro data, and then we're going to be able to compute these productivity terms for these differential sectors. So some things which I want to highlight. First, I mentioned this already. It's only that these kind of input output matrix weighted average parameters are omega and nu and, and productivity matters. And so, you know, whether or not the value added for services or for agriculture is going to be non homothetic depends exactly on the correlation between the non homothetic terms at the good level and the sectoral shares. So, as a particular example, you know, suppose every good uses consumer services in the same proportions, right? If lambda ns was not a function of n, then it could be that at the individual good level, there's lots of non homotopicities We, you know, reallocate spending from agriculture to um, movies, movie theaters. But if the production of these goods uses consumer service value at an equal proportions, the value added demand system will actually be called Douglas and will be homothetic, right? So it's the correlation between Lambda and Kappa, which matters for the non-homotopicity of value added. Second, Michael, sorry. please. Um, so you basically like the impact on the income distribution it will come from the impact on regions, right? That would be like the the, the mechanism. So, I mean, have you tried like an alternative specification of the model in which basically you have mobility across regions, but basically you have more specificity of labor to, to certain sectors, something we, like that? Absolutely. So that's going to be, I'm going to, I, I promise many clicks here. I'm going to click on this at the end. But I think you're absolutely right. So we did a version of this model, which you think might be more kind of relevant and realistic. We did a version of this model where you have people are high and low skilled. Uh, and so you don't have this perfect substitutability assumption, but the high skilled work, particularly in, you know, producer services and maybe consumer services, the low skilled work in agriculture, something which we see very clearly in the data. And so we did estimate the model under that, uh, under that setting. And as you can imagine, um, you know, we're going to find that that actually amplifies this effect of consumer service productivity on, on inequality. And you can already see why, right? Precisely because the service sector is on average more skill intensive, right? So then you don't only have this kind of aggregate productivity shifter, say in Delhi, but labor demand in particular kind of shifts out for the rich in Delhi. I'm going to show you these numbers, how important, how important that is um, uh, at, at the end. We did also experiment with differences in inequality across space and time. So in particular, we entertained this hypothesis that maybe what's going on in say Delhi is that there's really, you know, lots of income growth at the very, very top, you know, the top 5%, top 1% in Delhi. You know, we didn't find much evidence for that. I'm not saying it's not there. I think just with our micro data, it, it gets kind of very noisy in the tail out there, right? There's a lot of data. And, and so, you know, we didn't find really strong evidence for that in, in our estimation. That's why we took this shape parameter to be the same. And, uh, you know, in the paper, we show some robustness that didn't really seem to matter very much. Uh, but, but I'm going to come back to the specificity of labor, which I think is important. Okay, thanks. And so finally, this is what I've been talking about for the estimation, right? The interesting thing about this aggregate demand system is that that epsilon, that structural parameter is the same in the micro demand system for final good and the aggregate demand system for sectoral value added. So that's a structural parameter which is portable and survives both the aggregation from micro to macro and the aggregation from final goods to aggregate sectoral value added. You see here that these omegas and the kappas, that's not going to be the same, right? For most other structural parameters, you know, you can't really go from final expenditure to value added, but for this epsilon, you can. And that's the main parameter which we're going to estimate from the micro data. 
Good. Last slide on the theory. Um, so once we have this all in place, uh, we can define the equilibrium. And this equilibrium, there's going to be uh, you know, three types of conditions. There's going to be the local labor market clearing condition for consumer services. It's non-tradable, right? So the income produced in consumer services in Region R is going to be equal to the total spending on consumer service in Region R. There's going to be the market clearing for tradable goods, which have the usual kind of Armington style structure, right? Where income for say agriculture in Region R just is the sum of all spending on agricultural goods uh, out of all other regions, subject to some kind of iceberg trade costs and there's labor market clearing. So our um, quantitative um, approach to this question relies on these equilibrium conditions a lot. So in particular, we're going to use those to do our accounting exercise. And so how is this going to work? We're going to measure these objects. And in the next slide, I'm going to tell you how we measure this. So we're going to measure wages, employment shares of human capital in these different sectors. We're going to measure average human capital. We're going to measure trade costs by using some um, you know, distances across space. So then we're going to estimate these structural parameters on preferences, in particular the epsilon, but also the others. And then conditional on these preferences and the measured quantities and prices for human capital, we're going to infer or estimate productivity for consumer services in Region R, for, uh, and then for all the other sectoral goods in Region R. Okay? Uh, and so once we have done that, we're going to basically ask this exercise. We're going to do a general equilibrium counterfactual, exactly as, as Mariana highlighted, you know, taking all this reallocation into account. And our main one is going to be, suppose we set the consumer service productivity in 2011 and Region R back to its 11 in 1987, what would have happened, who would have gained, who would have lost? Okay. Um, just to remind you, and this goes back to this, uh, you know, question, I think Gustavo asked us about the, uh, about the non-homotheticities. Taking into account the non-homotheticities is very important to do a robust estimation for productivity. In particular, right, the equilibrium implies that the employment share on consumer services is equal to the spending share. And so you, here you see exactly the two stories, service-led versus the corollary or, you know, service-biased growth uh, on the right-hand side. Here is the income effect, right? Remember, this new is going to be negative, right? So as wages rise in a particular location, that means you know, this piece goes down, given the minus, here's going to be another minus. So as wages rise, the employment share of services goes up. As human capital accumulates in a particular location, consumer service employment goes up because people get richer. As prices for tradable goods fall in a particular location, the demand for consumer services go up because people have because people have people are richer right so these are going to be these income effect channels the remainder is going to be exactly the service led piece right the high productivity in consumer services holding wages human capital and the price of tradable good constant a rise in consumer service productivity is going to explain or is going to you know induce a rise in consumer service employment and so here you see again this epsilon, which is going to be the crucial parameter to modulate the strength of these effects, right? Okay, so let's go to the measurement. So here's going to be the measurement. And here I can go back to, uh, you know, to Marco's question about how do you treat waiters versus uh, lawyers and financiers? So our main data set is going to be the NSS National Sample Survey. It's going to be micro survey 400 districts uh, for, for both years, 1987-2011. Uh, it allows us to measure earnings, sectoral employment, and schooling to measure this human capital in Region R. Second data set which we're going to use, we're going to use a survey on household expenditure. So there, we're going to estimate these angle curves, which I showed you on the fourth slide, the extent to which the expenditure share in particular goods declines as people get richer. And from that micro-estimation, we're going to be able to pick up this angle elasticity. And then finally, we're going to use um, a data set which I at least haven't seen used before in India. It's going to be the survey of service firms in India. And that survey is going to be useful to help us to allocate service workers to the retail sector versus to the producer services or tradable services like finance and lawyers. So let me show you how we do that. So we start out with the NSS microdata. 
And so out of this NSS microdata, we're going to see where people work. And we're going to measure this for 22 subsectors based on the classical NIC classification. So for agriculture and manufacturing, we're going to do a relatively easy assignment. You know, agriculture goes to agriculture. Manufacturing goes to what we call industry. Now for services, the situation is more interesting. How many of those are retail workers? How many of those are maybe finance workers, which are really producing tradable goods? And so for that, we're going to use exactly the survey of service firms. So what does this survey of service firms allow us to do? The survey of service firms is a micro, micro survey of about 150,000 service firms. They are present in different sectors, wholesale, finance, real estate, transportation, etc. We have this for eight subsectors. And so one question which gets asked to these service firms is the following. In the survey, they ask them, do you sell to consumers or do you sell to other firms? Now, I'm almost embarrassed to show this here, that given that you know, Federico is in the audience. <laughs> so this is kind of our approach to somehow, you know, in India, we don't have data on like firm to firm trade or value added taxes where we can exactly see, you know, how much of the value added produced in a particular firm is going to be traded to another firm, in which case that firm might produce a tradable good. We're going to have to rely on this kind of survey question. And so what we're going to do precisely is we're going to say, if you're a firm that sells to other firms, we're going to call you a producer service. And so the employment in your firm is going to be allocated to the industrial sectors. So these are going to be for us, lawyers, financiers, right? So people who work in ICT, who mostly provide inputs to the industrial sectors, which in the sense is tradable, we're not going to measure these people as providing human capital to consumers directly. We are only going to you know, count, quote unquote, the people that work in firms where, uh, which sell to consumers directly. So you can literally think of that. If we had micro data on firm to firm trade, there would be no need to do that. We could just directly allocate how much of employment, how much of the value added of employment ends up directly in co for consumers in region R, how much of the value added of employment ends up in the allocation or the purchase of value added someplace else. We're going to do it this way. So, um, you know, given this procedure, um, when we detail, obviously write this in much more detail in the paper, this allows us to estimate, you know, how much of employment in all these different subsectors is going to be allocated to consumer services, how much of this is allocated to precisely these tradable producer services. Just to give you an example of about of some numbers, for wholesale and retail trade, we estimate that roughly 95% of employment is actually the consumer services, 5% is for, for producer service. For ICT, the number is much smaller. We estimate roughly 40% is due to consumers, 60% is allocated to firms. Um, you know, later, once I show you the result, I'm going to show you various kind of different approaches you could have taken to try to try to do this classification. Michael? Yes, please. Can I ask you something on that? So, so I guess this is the part of the data that sort of prevents you from doing all of the exercise with, say, the US data, right? I mean, Yes. Other than that, you would. Other than this, you could do this all Absolutely. these calculations with the U.S. Absolutely. So I guess one alternative strategy would be to just, you know, given the result that you just mentioned, say something like, you know, retail is final, is final consumers, basically, and then use input output tables to kind of do this the splitting of, you know, what's final versus what's intermediate in terms of, you know, treating retail. As, as that. Absolutely. Uh, do you have a sense of like how bad it would be, like what other problems you would have if you were to do something like that? Because it has the advantage that you can sort of scale this up to other countries and compare, you know, across countries, how services sort of, you know, I mean, the role of services for development. I guess. Totally agree. So we do an exercise in the paper where we uh, actually use the um, use input output matrices or the, the aggregate input output matrix in India to try to get a sense of, you know, how much of service employment in India should we be thinking about providing these producer services? And so, you know, our estimation tells us that about 
of Indian service employment is what we would call producer services or tradable services. If you do the input output matrices, we in the aggregate, you know, one number which you could get is maybe about 20%. Why do I say 20%? When you look at the input output matrix for the total output of the service sector, roughly 20% is used as an intermediate input someplace else in the economy. So if you think about that's a rough order of magnitude, about 80%. I'm going to show you these numbers, what comes out when you kind of scale up the, or scale down the consumer service employment by that margin. Um, the one thing which I like better about our approach, at least conceptually, you know, it takes into account the regional heterogeneity a little more, right? Uh, and so that I think is given our focus on sort of this kind of spatial heterogeneity, this is something which we kind of like to keep. Now, we're currently working actually with uh, some research in the World Bank precisely to develop a kind of measurement tool to sort of scale this up for multiple countries because we think at least from the, you know, the aggregate patterns look very much like in other poor countries today. I mean, your work with Richard kind of told us that too. And so it would be interesting for us to kind of know, is this something about India? You know, does it look the same in Kenya, in Nigeria, Sub-Saharan Africa? So we're currently working with people at the World Bank to try to you know, think about how this could be scaled up. But in principle, I agree with you. If you were to ask me, what happens if I just forget about this particular way of treating the data and I go just go to these subsectors in, in the service industry and I say, look, if I see an NIC classification, retail, consumer, if I see finance, I want to call it producer, you know, you're going to go pretty far and, you know, our numbers are not going to be so different, right? I think one sector where this becomes a little more salient is actually transport, right? Transport has been growing quite a bit in India and for transport, it, it has these features that some are like rickshaw drivers, and some are sort of, you know, delivering goods. Um, but, I, you know, I think the first order results, which I'm going to show you, then they're not going to be hinging on exactly that measurement. Um, good. So given this data, we're going to need nine structural parameters. We're going to need these preference parameters, epsilon, the news, the omegas. We're going to need this elasticity substitution, the tail parameters from, for human capital. So given the, you know, I have 25 minutes left, so I'm not going to show you sort of the identification of all of the, all of these. Um, so let me just briefly mention how we do it. The one thing which I'm going to show you in more detail is this angle elasticity, this epsilon, because that's going to be the important one um, for the quantitative results. For the skill heterogeneity, um, you know, given the Pareto distribution, the skill heterogeneity tail is going to be exactly the tail of the local income distribution. So we're going to use our micro data on income to try to estimate this tail parameter. For the preference parameters, um, we're going to do the following. Um, we're going to have these three news and the three omegas. These are going to be six parameters. So two of those are going to be implied by homogeneity restriction on preferences. So we need four moments to estimate the rest. As we show in the paper, one of them we can normalize without loss of general, without loss of general generality to a constant because it's not separately identified from the level of productivity. So we have three left. And so for these three, we're going to use two moments from our data. In particular, we're going to use our model to exactly match the aggregate agricultural employment share in 87 and 2011. There's going to be two restrictions. And then we're going to do one, which is the asymptotic value added share on food. Right? And so we're going to set this to a small number. So in the US, the, agri the asymptotic agricultural share is about 0 0.01, 0 0.02. In Spain and France, a little higher, 0 0.04. So we're going to think about an asymptotic expenditure share on food on value added of about 0 0.01. Uh, you know, this is not going to be matter very much. So in the paper we report, if we pick it to 0.05, right? This is going to be our, our identification. And so that the, the key thing which is missing is this angle elasticity. So let me show you in a little more detail how we estimate that one. So go back to the final good demand system, right? So the expenditure share on good N was, took this one. So now as you suppose you take a particular commodity or group of commodities for which you think that this asymptotic expenditure share is small. Food comes to mind, right? That's what we're going to take. And so for food, where this beta is small, uh, you can see here that the spending share 
is going to take this nice log linear structure between spending and income. In particular, all these kind of regional prices, which differ because of trade costs, etc., they're going to factor out, they're going to look like a region fixed effect. And the elasticity between spending and the spending share is exactly this angle elasticity, right? And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to measure in the micro data the expenditure at the household level for food varieties. We're going to have 17 food varieties. Um, and so we're going to run regressions at the micro level. We're going to run the spending share of household age and region R on food. We're going to run it on a region fixed effect that captures these price effects. And then, um, you know, total spending, the coefficient should be exacted as epsilon. And then we're going to have some controls on the right hand side, right, to think about maybe some correlated preference shocks that might be correlated with income, you know, household size, for example, whether or not you live in the city, some of these things. So let me just first show you how the data looks like. If you do a bin scatter plot between log food share and log expenditure after taking out this regional fixed effect, you know, you see that for a good chunk of this distribution, this kind of log linear structure doesn't seem to do too much damage to the data. It looks roughly log linear. In particular, you know, there's no sense in which these kind of non-homothicity seem to be disappearing as people get very rich, right? So here's what this looks like in a regression. If you run like the very simple regression, this we have like about 100,000 households where we have complete data on spending shares on epsilon, you estimate an elasticity of about, you know, 3.2. Um, when you put in controls, these household controls, and, you know, we have, um, you know, cast, um, household size, whether, you, whether or not in your district you live in a city, in a rural area, uh, you control for these things, you don't change the elasticity very much, it stays roughly 0.3. Um, when you do an IV, uh, where you might be thinking that if you had measurement error and expenditure, you might be downward biasing this epsilon, and that's what we're particularly kind of concerned about, right? Because if we estimate a very small epsilon, we sort of amplify these results on productivity growth. If you do an IV where we use the occupational distribution in the household as an instrument for total spending, um, we estimate an elasticity, which is a little higher, but it's kind of in the same ballpark about roughly, let me say 0.4, minus 0.4. So then um, we can run this regression, not at the kind of household level, right? By looking at the aggregate spending share on food varieties. In principle, we can do this at the food item level, right? For rice, for sorghum, for tobacco, for all these food products. When we do this, and when we kind of pool all the data, so now we have about, you know, 1.1 million observations, and, you know, have like region food item fixed effect, we estimate elasticity, which is very similar to the aggregate, roughly 0.3. Um, finally, when you stare at this scatter plot for a long time, as we did when writing these papers. And when you go very close, you know, you see that there seems to be a different slope here at the bottom and at the top, right? And so when you do that and you try to estimate these angle curves differentially for poor and rich households, you know, you do find a different elasticity. It's, it's a little lower for the poor household and it's a little higher for the rich households. Now for our quantitative exercise, we're going to actually take this IV estimate as the baseline, 0.39. So why do we take the IV estimate at the baseline? A, and I'll you know, show you different choices for epsilon. Um, you know, we wanted to lean on the conservative side where we wanted to pick an epsilon which is on the higher end of these estimates. When we look at this inequality aspects, you know, we definitely didn't want to kind of bias downwards the extent to which in particular the rich people have homothetic demand. And so this 0.39, this seems to be more in line with what we estimate for rich people there. Third, we were kind of concerned that, you know, if you think that poor people get some or lots of their, uh, you know, food spending through subsistence work, we might underestimate this elasticity because, you know, as the poor get into the middle class, you know, we see them kind of dropping expenditure, you know, we, we don't see them dropping their expenditure on food if they might just drop the type of food which they get from subsistence, subsistence work which is consistent with this idea that this elasticity is small for poor households. So all the baseline results, which I'm going to show you, it's going to have an epsilon of about 3.4. Uh, and I'm going to show you some different, you know, different results based on other calibration strategies at the end. Okay. So now that we have everything in place, uh, we can estimate the model and we can estimate 
consumer service or, or sectoral productivity growth or productivity estimates for 1987 and for 2011 across the entire regional distribution in India. Let me just show you first what the spatial distribution and productivity looks like. Right? So what you see here is a bin scatter plot of the level of consumer service productivity in region R against the urbanization rate. There's nothing special about the urbanization rate. For us, this is just a way how to order locations, right? And we think of you know, the urbanization rate, think of this as a measure of economic development. So what I think this analysis kind of highlights, which I think is important, is that cities, Delhi, Mumbai, Bangalore, they not only have high employment and consumer services because people in these places are rich and educated, but they have high employment in these activities because they're productive in it, right? So there's big discrepancy across space in the consumer service productivity and cities are particularly good at this. When you look at the aggregate level, when you aggregate these consumer service productivities in these sectors using you know, regional expenditure weights as weights, this is what we get. At the aggregate level, we find agriculture grows at about 2%. The industrial sector goods is about three and a half percent. Consumer services are about 4.7 percent. I'm going to show you later, maybe I'm going to show you this now, how this compares to other estimates of consumer service productivity growth. And so let me just click on this. So we validate the model in various dimensions. The one which I'm going to show you, which I think is the most interesting, is suppose you go to aggregate data. I'm going to call this like Groningen, right? From the Groningen database, the economic transformation database. And so this is what this looks like. So when you do it in Groningen and you measure agriculture, consumer services, and manufacturing, this is what you find. You do find, and I think that's kind of important in its own right, even in the aggregate data, you find substantial productivity growth in consumer services. It's a little lower than in our data. In particular, in the aggregate data, you know, the manufacturing industry has, you know, is kind of predicted to have higher productivity growth than we find in our model. So we personally, you know, we spent a lot of time going back and forth. We think, at least for our context, sort of our estimates are in that sense preferable because they're, you know, at least consistent with sort of the micro data, consistent how we treat the micro data and allocate, of, allocate employment. But I'm going to show you an alternative calibration where we don't use the expenditures, this expenditure patterns to estimate this angle elasticity at all, but we pick the angle elasticity such that the implied productivity growth, which comes out of our model, is going to line up with Groningen. And so I'm going to show you these results at the end. Uh, they're not going to be very different than, than the ones which I'm going to show you from the baseline. Okay, so in the last 15 minutes, let me just show you the results, right? The results on inequality and the results on the structural transformation. So here's what we're going to do. So we want to measure this welfare effect of rising CS productivity and the way we're going to measure it, we're going to measure it as an equivalent variation. So I always have to put the whole sentence here because otherwise I'm not going to be able to say exactly what we do. This is the, this is the object which we okay, compute. We ask by how much could we change an individual's income in 2011 to make them indifferent between the status quo and the situation where, for example, consumer service productivity had not grown at all since 1987. Okay. And so this object, what we call omega Q, is implicitly defined by this equation, right? It's going to be an increase or reduction of the, way, of the total income of a person with, with human capital Q in, in 2011 to make him or her indifferent with the allocation in, in 1987. So a number of, say, 20%, minus 20% seems you would be happy to give away 20% of your income in 1987 to kind of remain there rather than not to see this, uh, rather than to not see productivity growth um, between 87 and 1987 uh, and 2011. And we're going to compute this object in three layers. We're going to look at individual heterogeneity. We're going to look at how does this omega vary across the income distribution, Q? We're going to look at regional welfare by computing utilitarian welfare for each location in uh, India. And then I'm going to give you the aggregate numbers, which we're just going to take to, take to be the populated, populated weighted average of the utilitarian welfare. So let me show first, let me first show you the inequality. Um, 
On the left here, you see the individual heterogeneity in this object and this willingness to pay, right? I'm going to show you this for different quantiles of the Indian income distribution. So this is the 10th, 25, 50, 75, 90, 95, and 99 quantile of the income distribution. And so we compute this object for every person, if you want so, in India, and then we just aggregate this for these different quantiles, which just makes it easy for me to uh, relay these results. And what you see here is that consumer service productivity growth is very pro-rich, right? You know, below the median, the willingness to pay for productivity growth is about, you know, maybe around 18%. For the rich, it's going to be a much bigger number. It's more on the order of magnitude of like 35 and 40%. So, um, you know, these confidence intervals here is basically we estimate the distribution of these gains using like a bootstrap procedure. I'm not going to talk about this much so you can focus on kind of the average, right? So the key takeaway, the poor, they don't respond so much to consumer service productivity growth, about 20%. For the rich, this is going to be very important. Why is that the case? It's the case because of two reasons. First, the rich spend a lot of their income on consumer services. And so they're going to be very exposed to these price changes. Second, and I'm going to show you this in the, on the next graph, the rich tend to live in places, namely cities, where productivity growth in consumer services grew a lot, right? If you work, if you live in the rural area and you're poor, like, it's likely that you spend a big share of your budget on agriculture it's likely that your location didn't experience a lot of growth in consumer service productivity. And because that's a non-tradable good, you're not going to care about this too much. These are going to be these numbers. Here you see this across the income, across the urbanization distribution, right? For people who live below the, in the lower four quartiles of the urbanization distribution, you know, their uh, welfare gains, they're going to be roughly comparable to somewhere below the median in the income distribution. If you live in the city, you're almost like a rich person, right? And so this is because many rich people live in cities, but not only. There are some poor people in cities, and those people, the poor people in cities, they actually do benefit a lot from this consumer service uh, productivity growth. Now, to put this into perspective, this is what agriculture and industry looks like. Right? For agriculture, you see, for a big chunk of the population, you know, for 75% of the Indian population, agriculture really accounts for the bulk of the rising living standards, right? Below the median, this is much bigger than consumer service productivity, 25, 28%. For the very rich, agricultural productivity growth really doesn't matter much. They live in cities, they don't spend very much on it. It's more like 12%. Industry is kind of in between. It is pro-rich because we estimate industrial goods to be slightly luxury goods, so the rich spend more on it, and you have more productivity growth in, let me show you this here, in cities where the industrial employment share is going to be larger, right? So the main takeaway here is growth in consumer services is beneficiary to the rich, it's beneficiary to people in the cities, for agriculture is directly the opposite. Now, once you integrate these numbers over the income and urbanization distribution, you get roughly like this, right? For consumer services, you know, you estimate an aggregate welfare gain of about 25%. Uh, for agriculture, it's a little below, maybe 20%. For industry, it's a little below, it's about 18%. Now, if you ask me how to interpret these numbers, if you walk away from this talk and you say, these three sectors are roughly of equal importance for the development process in India. I would be very, you know, fine with that interpretation, right? So this black line, this is, this is uh, just to give you a sense, this is going to be the, um, you know, the total increase in welfare between 1987 and 2011. So if you take somebody in India, the representative household in 2011 and ask him by how much would you be willing to reduce your income today? to not live in 1987, that person would say by about two thirds, 66%. And so from that perspective, productivity growth and consumer services accounts for roughly a third of this rise in welfare uh, between 1987 and 2011. Now, um, I'm going to have eight minutes left, so I can, I think, click on, click on two things. Uh, in particular, so Mariana in the beginning asked, what happens to the structural transformation for sector re reallocation? So I can click on that. So um, here's what uh, this figure, what this figure shows. 
So in each of our counterfactual, for example, orange, that's the counterfactual we say, suppose consumer service productivity had not grown, we can compute the aggregate employment share in agriculture, consumer services, and industrial sector. In red, you see what happened in the data in India, right? So this is exactly this decline of agricultural employment by 16 percentage point, the increase of service employment of about you know, 15 percentage points, the increase in industrial employment, you know, you could almost not see it from the time series of about you know, two percentage points. If the consumer service sector had been stagnant, you would have seen a decline in agriculture, but about half of what we've seen in the data. You would have seen an increase in consumer service employment, about half of what we've seen in the data. So this is the part in which income effects and other substitution elasticities are real, right? Even if there was no productivity growth, sure, India is richer today, people leave agriculture, where do they go? They do go into consumer services, but to explain the fact in the data that agricultural employment declines a lot and industrial and service employment uh, increases very, very much, you know, it seems that this kind of productivity growth in consumer services is really important. Um, so that's the sense in which, um, you know, this consumer service productivity growth is important for welfare and is important for the structural transformation. Now, I also promised you a bunch of robustness results. Um, let me just click on this one. Um, and maybe let me highlight, I think Gustavo asked this about uh, skill specificity, right? I think this is interesting. So what we do there, you know, uh, you can imagine what we do. We're gonna have a low and high skill CES. We're gonna have an elasticity of substitution of about 1.5. And in particular, we're going to estimate the extent to which some sectors like the consumer service sector or, you know, lawyers, et cetera, uh, use more high skilled work than low skilled work. Um, so in the paper we show that we can still identify, you know, the model perfectly so that, uh, or we can rationalize the data kind of perfectly. Uh, so in that sense, the, the, the conceptual strategy is exactly the same as what I showed you. What you see here, these are the baseline numbers. I have this here by urbanization. So the baseline numbers were the welfare effect for consumer services in, by urbanization was about 17% in rural districts, 41% in cities. Once you allow for this imperfect substitutability, if anything, you increase the spread. And the reason, as you can imagine, is, you know, people with a lot of human capital, they live in cities. Those sectors, consumer services, they use high school people intensely because in the data, we see many of those work there. Once you, you know, if, if this productivity growth hadn't happened, that's particularly bad for cities, we have a lot of it, and it's particularly, uh, bad for high skilled people that happen to also live in cities. And so, you know, that increases this spread. Now, we also do some exercises for how we do the measurement. In particular, you know, if we, for example, allocate the entirety of the ICT sector and the entirety of business sector to what we call kind of producer services. So basically we're gonna say, you know, no lawyer is a divorce lawyer that caters to consumers. Everybody's a corporate lawyer and is tradable. Um, as you can imagine, you know, that reduces the role for consumer services because, you know, we just don't count a bunch of employment, but these numbers are still big. So even if you, if you put everything in finance and everything in, uh, in ICT out of the consumer service sector, you're still going to have a 20% welfare gain, uh, welfare gain in consumer services. And, you know, we do the open economy. And so, you know, what you should be seeing from these numbers is the order of magnitude that the aggregate consumer service effect is on the order of magnitude between 20 and 26% willingness to pay, that this is much higher for urban and for rural district, that is going to be consistent across all of these measurements, right? This one is interesting, you know, as we kind of move away lawyers and, and employment and finance away from the consumer service sector, you do take away some of these gains in cities. And I think that reflects the fact in my very first slide, right, I showed you this kind of red bars of the increase of consumers of employment in ICT and, and for finance, which mainly took, plus, took place in cities. This is exactly the difference between, say, 40 percent and 30 to 25 percent. OK, I have. So, um, yes. Sorry, just one one small question. So maybe this is a little bit beyond, but I would just want to see your 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 uh, sort of impression of, of what's going on in terms of these productivities of services? Is it more like 
technological features that they're sort of improving the technology in the services so is it maybe reforms government reforms are improving maybe the the allocative efficiency of them sort of more reallocation that makes them sort of better or what's sort of behind it i think it's both i think sort of a maybe an example in the indian context which would be technological in nature is you know suppose changes in say logistics make it easier to have like a big supermarket rather than kind of many moms and pop stores so this would in the data kind of show up presumably right that more people work in this in the retail sector because now you can work in the supermarket wages go up people work there i and our our model and i think our conceptual leave we would say sure that is what consume what is that is what productivity in retail looks like you know if we go from small mom and pop shores to walmart that is a piece of productivity growth which took place in consumer services so you know logistics ict which makes it easier to run these supply chains to do the logistics for a big uh, you know retail manufacturing I, uh, retail place that would be a, a technological nature of consumer service productivity i think as far as like restaurants and so on goes i mean i personally i think i think sort of these unmeasured types of variety gains i think are very important i think the entry of you know multiple restaurants that deliver to different tastes you know we know from theory that this is a, a rise in it's like a welfare relevant increase in productivity which we would you know hardly measure from the data I think our model is going to capture that, right? Because we're going to say, look, people are going to be spending a lot on on these uh, uh, on these on these activities. If that is um, if that causes employment in these activities to go up, we would account for that as sort of a rise in utility, uh, which would be, would be these variety gains. And I think you can also think about regulation, right? I don't know. I mean. I don't know, I should know this better, I think, in India. Um, you know, you know, there were all these size restrictions in India. If these were binding, for example, for big retail chains, once you take these restrictions away and retail chains in consumer services uh, are going to be more efficient, I think that would be a pure reallocation gain, which we would presumably measure as a rise in productivity growth, right, in consumer services. Now, um, you know, let me just conclude let me just conclude right here, uh, and then we have, you know, roughly 10 minutes. Um, well, you've seen the paper. Uh, you know, we try to estimate how important are consumer services for India. We found that they are, in particular, and for, and as far as welfare is concerned, they're pro-rich, they're particularly salient for urban consumers. I think these results, at least in our mind, they sort of raise a much more important question. How should we think about these patterns of premature deindustrialization? Is there a sense in which rising productivity in consumer service and other service industries can sort of substitute for missing the for missing industrialization or more broadly as you've seen in the structural structural transformation graph which i showed you maybe this premature deindustrialization is a consequence of productivity growth and services today being faster than they were maybe 80 years ago um, so i think i mentioned this what we want to do with this kind of framework going forward is trying to improve the measurement and trying to think about whether these patterns are representative of the developing world today or if this is just something which happens to be true in India. And let me conclude right here and uh, and and obviously um, you know we can we can discuss more. So maybe I'm just going to stop sharing so I can uh, I can see some more of your of your pictures. <laughs> Great, thanks, Michael. This was great. Um, so we have a couple of more minutes for sort of open discussion. So just fire away if you have questions or comments. I ask you, is, is related about the. Have you seen that there is difference in in the in the region when uh, services have been growing, the productivity higher, more faster than in other. Some changes in the participation of women in the labor force. That is the other way that. Uh, many people are looking that there is has been a huge change in the in the in the production function at home. People are moving. So, if... great question. So we did not do anything yet on that margin. That we could do more. In particular, the one thing which I think would be interested, which we could look at in our data, is I think, in some sense, run this regression of you know 
female changes in female employment shares on changes in recovered kind of productivity. Yeah. And that would be interesting to know. I don't know the answer to that. But um, you're absolutely right that I think this idea of is this rise in service employment, to what extent is this really an, uh, like a movement from home to market mm -hmm. production, right? That is, uh, I think, a, a, a kind of a key question for this whole agenda. And in fact, for this project with the World Bank, one thing which we do want to use explicitly is data, micro data on time use to think about, you know, is this just, you know, people used to cook themselves and now they go to a restaurant and, you know, to the extent that that is not equal across, uh, across gender, I think exactly as you highlight, that's going to be very interesting implications for, you know, inequality across gender, labor force participation across gender. I, I'm totally uh, bored. We didn't do anything yet on, on that front though. May I ask you another question? Is absolutely how sensitive is the result in terms of the of the utility function? Because you can't. I was thinking, why you don't use a, a normal CS utility function with low elasticity of substitution, and you will get something like this also to see how much the result are uh, driven by the by the, the production function. I think you can do it. Is yes. So we, so we didn't want to do a, a regular CS because we really wanted to get the income effects. So that yeah. we did. So, so we really wanted to, to capture this idea that, you know, rich people um, have different shares. And, and I think at least in the Indian context, you know, the, the, I think a sort of a homothetic CS, I think that wouldn't be a great starting point precisely because these angle curves would all be flat. Right. Um, now, the two things you could do, well, there's probably more, but two things we thought about. One, you could do like the stone geary, where you have a subsistence level of agriculture. I think conceptually, you know, nothing what I showed you, I think this would all work. Um, we know from earlier work uh, that the stone geary is kind of very restrictive. In particular, it implies that, you know, this nonomotheticity is kind of going away very, very quickly. Like when I showed you this log linear relationship between spending yeah. shares and income, if you compute that from a stone geary, it looks more like this, like very convex, whereby, you know, as soon as you're, let's call it in the middle class, you're sort of out of this non-homotheticity region. So then the other thing which we did think about, and I, I think, um, you know, Jorge uses, uses that in, in, in his paper on Canada, a non-homothetic CES. So this is actually one thing which we, thought about more specifically, the reason why we didn't do it is that the non-homothetic CS works great when you have a representative agent, but with inequality, it's a little tricky because it's implicitly defined. And so it was just more difficult to handle. Now, one thing which we do in the, which we do in the paper um, is that given our estimation, we can compute you know, the elasticity of substitution and the spending elasticities, how they vary across yeah. the income distribution. And there, at least, they look roughly in line with what other people report. So, for example, the Komin, Mestieri, uh, Lashkari paper, they report yeah. these objects for different countries. They didn't report India. I should have asked them maybe, but they, you know, did it for Tanzania and, and many other countries. And so where, you know, the implied elasticity of substitution are sort of in the ballpark. That lends me to believe that if I were to take the non homothetic CES and mm -hmm. estimate it to the same data, the numbers wouldn't be so different. But I, this is just a guesstimate, so we didn't implement that um, because it was sort of difficult with this, uh, with the heterogeneity. Um, well, I, I had another question with regards to the estimation of the epsilon that you showed us. So I knew you you had like this robustness checks section uh, that we didn't get to. So I was wondering uh, because there's there's some work in how this elasticity changes when you control for key demographic things such as age. So for instance, huh. I was, like India has changed uh, considerably in the period that you are, and there's also significant therefore like significant heterogeneity that can have an impact on on your estimate. Uh, so I don't know if you guys in the paper have explored uh, that uh, specification and how that Good. affects the epsilon and therefore 
the rest of the results. Very good. I would. I think actually, I don't know the. I don't know the result. What how important that is because in our baseline specification, the thing we always control for is age and household size because it's okay. a household level. So, but it, you're right. I would. It would be interesting to know what happens if you don't do it. If these elasticities look very different. My hunch is that probably, you know, household size kind of absorbs a bunch of, uh, a bunch of that variation, but I don't know the answer to the question. So I'm, I'm not sure what, what happens there. We found at least for this angle curves for food, I mean, I showed you these estimates, you know, we didn't really find that that elasticity is going to, is, is very sensitive to whether or not you control for other demographics. And now the R square changes a lot, right? I mean, once you kind of control for where they live, subsistence and non-subsistence, but that income elasticity, that was relatively insensitive to, 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 the, to the controls, which we considered at least. Um, I see, I see. But, the, but we didn't do the, we, I think we never really run it without the age. We always put sort of age of the household head and, uh, and how many people are in the household okay. on the right hand okay. side. Um, Okay, thank you. Sure.